Let's do it. First step, Toxoplasma gondii, maybe the most important protozoa you, you can do out of this whole out of this whole program. All right, so pay attention. Pregnant women. Okay, first off, I want to give a shout out to my dad and brother who came all the way from Los Angeles. So, actually, Los Angeles is also known as Tarantulas because there's a lot of Persians. And that, that actually gives me a segue because for those. Does anyone know what this is? Oh my god. <laughs> How many Persians do we have here? Oh yeah. So, you guys know what it is. This is called Gondi. It's one of them. This is actually me. So I'm gonna leave it up to Joe, who I actually know, who I know is, who's, he changed his name into Pedram now. So this is Pedram, and I know where Ben is. To actually like go to the Persian palace and cook you guys like a good Gondi dish. So the reason why I'm saying Gondi and, un and meat, because it's actually um, transmitted, or the cysts are found in undercooked meat. Guys, remember, so, cysts. We talked about it last time in terminology. The cysts are the uh, forms, kind of like an egg. That's where the parasite sits when it's in an unfavorable environment. Exactly. So there's three plate. There's three ways to transmit toxoplasma. So there's going to be it's going to be through undercooked meat, which is actually going to have cysts. Again, because the parasite is li living outside the body, it's going to go through. It's going to be uh, transmitted through cat feces. And then it can also be transmitted through the placenta. We're actually going to get to the placenta later, but I want to focus on these two. This is also transmitted through cysts, or they're actually known as oocytes. Okay? So basically what happens is, guys, remember what we told you? There's the cyst, which is actually the egg, which actually protects the, top, the protozoa. And then when it finds a favorable condition, it hatches, okay? So what happens is, is you actually ingest these cysts. So you have your cysts here. You ingest the cysts, and it ends up in your GI tract. In your small intestine, specifically. So when you're in the body, it's now a favorable condition because it's warm. So now what happens is, the cysts actually hatch, and you form a trophozoa. Does everyone remember what a trophozoa is? So this is when you hatch out of the cyst, and now you form a trophozoa, which is actually the infected form of the, the toxoplasma. Okay, so now it's chilling in the GI tract. Can everyone see this? Cyst, you ingest the cyst, goes to the GI tract, it hatches, and you form a trophozoa. Because one thing, don't get confused. In the first aid, it says like you'll find toxoplasma in the tachyzoite form. Different books use different names. They're synonymous. Tachyzoite, so just make it easier. Trophozoite, just use tachyzoite. Tachyzoite, trophozoite, both do the same thing. They infect. Okay. Cyst doesn't infect. Tachyzoite. It's basically infect. synonymous. Tachyzoite, trophozoite, same thing. Remember, the zoa is what actually caused that infection. So now, it's actually going to be chilling. It's going to be chilling in your small intestine, and it wants to go in. It wants to go into your body. So what happens is, it's in your small intestine. It actually barges through. So here's your trophozoite. It barges through into the intestinal wall. Okay? After it barges through, it goes into your blood vessels of your intestine. So it goes into your blood vessels. So here's your tro your tro uh, tro or tachyzoite, or your toxoplasma. Okay, so it goes into the small intestinal wall, then it goes into the blood vessels. Now remember what I explained to you guys before. When you have a microbe or uh, anything that's foreign in your body, that's going into your body, into your blood, you're going to generate an immune response. So what happens is, is you actually have macrophages, which are actually, here's my macrophage, with its teeth, coming to gobble up the uh, uh, toxoplasma or the troph or tachyzoite. Okay, it actually ingests the tachyzoa, and it kind of tries to dissolve the, the bug from your body. But what happens is, is some of these uh, tachyzoites escape. Okay? <coughs> so here are your tachyzoites. 
they kind of escape, and they form cysts. So why is this, why is this happening? So the ones that escape, they're realizing that it's not a favorable condition anymore, because their immune system is triggered. So they want to form cysts. Remember, when it's not a favorable condition, you form a cyst, you form an egg to protect itself. So again, those that invade the macrophage form cysts, and then these cysts are all over your body, because these guys swim, and then they just be, create a capsule over themselves. Is everyone any questions so far? Is this important? Yeah. So you ingest it, it becomes a tachyzoa, it then goes into the... No, no, no. Cells? So you ingest it, it hatches from the cyst, right? So your cyst is like your egg. You ingest it as cysts. You ingest it as cysts. Yeah. Okay? Your small intestine is warm, it's a favorable environment. It hatches out of the egg, becomes a tachyzoa. Tachyzoa actually penetrates into your small intestine, gets into your blood vessels, and now it's in your blood. So now, your immune system sees there's something foreign in your body, and it sends macrophages to attack these tachyzoids. It's my only confusion. Should those small intestines be after the tachyzoids? The what? It means it goes in the cell, like it no. goes through the small intestine. This, like, this, is, this, is, this is the epithelium of the small intestine. So you know you have like, the layers of, of the epithelium. This would be the lumen of the small this intestine? This is the lumen. Right. Yes. But attaching before it goes into the small intestine. Yeah. It, hatch, yeah, it, it hatches, hatches before. It hatches before Guys, it goes in the small The only intestine. way a parasite can infect something is if it's in its zoite form. Okay? It can only infect that way. Alright? Think about it, egg can't do anything, but if the chicken comes out, then it can go fly. Right? So that's the same principle. Yeah. <laughs> 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 ingested it or before it escapes from the macrophages? No, so most of them get ingested by macrophages. But some escape? And some escape and they form cysts, because again, they see that there's not a favorable condition. So they want to be, get it, become an egg again, and then they just chill in your body. It's like not in the blood. Like thirty percent, I think, of people. Thirty percent of people have like toxoplasma in yeah. their bodies. People can be asymptomatic carriers. Why? Because they have cysts and they have a strong immune system. Yeah. Okay. Now, so if you're immune competent, so here's the thing: if you're immune competent, that means your immune system is fine. Okay. So when you're actually generating that attack. It says immune competent. I don't know how to spell, so just go with it. Okay? When you're immune competent, when you, gen you gen when you generate an attack with your macrophages, you're just going to get fever, lymphadenopathy, you're, you're going to get malaise. But this is initial. So when you initially get infected, yeah. then all this goes away and everything goes quiet. Exactly. But here's a trick. So how do they test this? They test it in an immune compromised person. But not just any immune compromised person. They specifically go after HIV patients. Specifically. John got, John's getting bored, so he's like finishing my sentence. This is how a relationship works. He finishes my sentence. Don't do this, So it happens in immune compromised people. Specifically HIV. So can anyone tell me why it would happen in an immune compromised person? Exactly. So you no longer have, it's actually CD4 positive T cells to generate an immune response. So now the, tact, now the cyst, the egg form, is chilling in your body. It's like, ah, this is a favorable condition now. Now I can, I can hatch out of my cyst form, become a tachyzoid again, and cause an immune reaction. But the immune cells are deficient, right? HIV, the reason why you, have, you end up going to AIDS is because your immune system is depleted. So what happens is you have a decreased immune function. <laughs> this causes your cysts to hatch, which leads to your tachyzoite. So here's what happens. Your tachyzoite goes to your brain, to the HIV person's brain, okay? And it forms something called an abscess. So what's an abscess? You guys are going to learn it again. You guys are going to learn it while you take them, you know? Basically what happens is, if you're actually causing damage to the tissue, your immune system wants to wall off the micro. It doesn't want it to spread to any other tissues. So it ends up being in the brain. Your immune system is, okay, we'll keep it in the brain. We don't want it to spread to your liver, liver to your lungs. We don't want it to spread. We want it to keep it contained within an abscess. So what's inside an abscess? Inside an abscess, you actually have the tachyzoite, and like neutrophils, macrophages, 
duking it out, but within a closed arena. You guys ever watch like the Greeks or the Romans, they have these like closed arenas? And you have your macrophage, it's one fighter, and you have the tachyzoid, it's another fighter. So they're duking it out. Okay? So the way the board likes to say this is when you have an abscess in the brain, they call it ring enhanced lesions. So why did they call it this? It's because you actually have a wall, so it's a it's a bright it's a bright white wall, and within it is the abscess. So you have a wall that's remember, guys, you surround the tachyzoid and the and the macrophage, and within it you have the attack going on. Does everyone understand that? Ring enhanced. So they're gonna say ring enhanced lesions in an HIV person. These are your key words. If you see HIV plus ring enhanced lesions, and they have they're gonna have CNS symptoms. So CNS symptoms can be seizures. It can be um, headaches. So if you see CNS symptoms plus HIV patients plus uh, ring enhanced lesions, please, guys, this is simple. You're dealing with toxoplasma going to add. What I want you to do, I want you to take any pen. I want you to make a one by HIV, two by seizure, three by ring enhanced lesions. Yeah. I cannot tell you how many questions I've seen on world, on quizzes, on boards, on MBMEs. They literally, in the question, you have, they say, an HIV patient comes in to the ER because they just had a tonic chronic seizure, okay? Um, on MRI, we see ring enhanced lesions. They give it to you straight out like that. So if you know that these three clues give you um, toxoplasma, you'll get this question right every time, okay? Yeah, guys, this is really important. What you just said is very important. So these are your three clues. They say they actually present it like this every time. Okay? Now, here's outlet. Remember guys, I said that you have your cysts that hatch, that go into your GI tract, right? This whole pathophysiology. There's one unique situation. So if a woman, a pregnant woman, gets infected with toxoplasma while she's pregnant, the toxoplasma can actually cross the placenta. and infect the baby. <coughs> so what's gonna, how is this baby gonna present? It's gonna have problems with its eyes. So it's, gonna, it's something called chorio, chorio retinitis. So chorio is the choroid, which is the second layer of your eye. Retina is a retina where you actually see things. So if it goes, for those who can't see this, it's chorioretinitis. Okay? And then itis, anytime you end with itis, it means inflammation, for those who don't know. You can also get hydrocephalus. All this means is your, actually your ventricles have more fluid. So they look enlarged. Okay? So they get more fluid in their ventricles, and their ventricles look enlarged. John will explain in a second how this presents. Okay? If you need to spell it, I wrote a figure here. You can't see. You're also getting, sorry guys, it's like a little jumbled up. You're also going to get intracranial calcifications. All this means is within your brain, you're going to actually get calcifications within the baby's brain. Again, chorioretinitis, you're going to see hydrocephalus and intracranial calcifications. But this is only when a pregnant woman is infected with toxoplasma while she has the fetus inside. She get, explain? If she get, this is important, guys. If a woman got infected with toxoplasma and then got pregnant, usually her body has built enough immune response to keep toxoplasma away from the fetus. But if a woman is pregnant, she can get toxoplasma and cause congenital toxoplasmosis. That's why they say for pregnant women, stay away from cats. Don't eat raw meat. It's for this reason, because they can get toxoplasmosis and that can cause serious problems for the baby. Unfortunately, unlike this kind of toxoplasmosis, the congenital toxoplasmosis, they, they don't make it as obvious. They don't tell you a baby gets born with chorioenteritis, hydrocephalus, and intracranial calcifications. It's not that simple, okay? They kind of give you like code words. They'll say for like chorioretinitis, a baby is born um, and he's blind, or he has lesions in the retina, or lesions in the eye. For hydrocephalus, what is hydrocephalus? Hydrocephalus is increased uh, cerebrospinal fluid in the brain. 
So remember we talked about way back in anatomy, Asaf told us about the fontanelles and how the baby's fontanelles are open, they're not closed yet. So what happens is since there's more fluid in the baby's brain and the skull is infused, they have a bigger head and the fontanelles are like kind of sticking out. So either they say, they'll say like the baby's head circumference is much bigger, like in the 90th percentile, or else say it has, um, you can feel the fontanelles like sticking out. But they will tell you intracranial calcifications. They'll say they find calcifications in the brain. Okay? But those three things tell you congenital toxoplasmosis. Okay? That's how it presents. Okay, so it's actually really important what John's saying, because like when you're pregnant, actually 80% of cats in the U.S. actually carry toxoplasma. So it's really important for women to stay away from catheters. Okay? Um, diagnosis. Okay. So if you take a biopsy of the... Yes, no. Wondering when you're talking about CNS symptoms, is it like any CNS symptoms or is it specifically seizures? Usually it's seizures, but it can be something more general like a headache or an altered mental status. Sure, mm, maybe. But usually you'll see seizures. You'll see like tonic clonic seizures. Okay. Yeah. Question. Can you just explain again, like in the ring region, like the attack is going on outside the wall or inside? Inside. <laughs> so the, you create a wall, an attackizoid, and the Protozoa are duking it out in there. Think about it, they make a wall so that the fight doesn't reach out to other parts of the body. Okay? okay Another yeah. question, Jeff? You said that this only happens if you get infected while you're pregnant. Yes, because before the, if the woman gets toxoplasma way before she gets pregnant, the body makes antibodies against toxoplasma. So if toxoplasma tries to come out and play when she's pregnant, the antibodies usually take care of it. The big issue is if a patient never had toxoplasma, gets pregnant, and then gets toxoplasma. Okay. One last question, then we gotta move on. Uh, someone who got toxoplasma, became immune to it, and then he contracts HIV. Will, will the toxoplasma research and then? So the qu the question was the question was if a patient is normal, they get toxoplasma, and then they get HIV. The answer is once they get HIV and they become uh, immunocompromised. Specifically, guys, this is actually important. Okay, this is a telltale sign. Um, uh, it's, it's called an AIDS-related, uh, an AIDS-defining illness, okay? When the CD4 count get less than 200, okay, that's when you can get toxoplasmosis. It'll make more sense in immuno, but this is just a random tidbit, okay? It's one of the things they can get. The whole point is when you're immune compromised, the cyst can actually hatch down, okay? So whatever causes you to be immune compromised, that's how the cysts are going to hatch. Hey guys, quickly, let's just finish this up. Diagnosis. You can take a biopsy of the brain, of the abscess, and you'll see tachyzoids, okay, on a, on a slide. Guys, again, I'm stressing this again. Diagnostic is ring enhanced lesions. You're going to see this. They're going to present you with an HIV patient, okay? They're going to tell you that he has seizures. They're going to give you the answer. Yes. You're just going to click toxoplasma gondia, yep. okay? And you're going to remember it's undercooked meat. Why? Because Persians love gondi. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, uh, why don't you raise them? Okay. So guys, yeah, treatment. Guys, the treatment's written down there, so nothing really, you know. So treatment is sulfa sulfa They're the eggs in the sketchy video. <laughs> and then they have purine with the meat. Guys, have it on your sheet. Okay. 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 Guys, I'm ready. Oh no. Damn. Really? Guys, I get another parasite. Another parasite? I gotta sit here again in the pie? <laughs> Damn, bro. <laughs> <laughs> okay, guys. So this next one is Naglarity. Go for it. Valerie. Okay? So this one's interesting. So basically what happens is, remember John explained to you guys about amoebas, how they swim around? So this Naglary Valerie has no cyst form. It has amoebas swimming around in fresh water. Okay? So a guy goes swimming in a freshwater lake. So here's your amoeba, you guys can draw it if you want. Okay? He's swimming in a freshwater lake. And what happens is amoebas actually swim into your nose, goes through your nasal mucosa, 
then goes to the cribriform plate and actually hits your brain. Okay, so you guys remember cribriform plate um, from uh, neuroanatomy. That's actually where your olfactory bulb is. Okay, this is where you smell. So what happens is you go into the nasal mucosa through the cribriform plate. into your brain. Guys, by the way, cribriform plate is a buzzword. Yeah. Okay? They can describe the glaria in a, in, a, in a question stem and then say, how did it get into the body? Also, amoebas is a buzzword. Because okay. we'll find amoebas, we'll tell you in a second half. So, it gets to your brain. So what does this cause? It actually causes meningoencephalitis. So let's break down this word. So remember, itis is inflammation. Meningo is the meninges. So those are your pad, your pia, your dura, your arachnoids, right? That's the mnemonic. And encephaly is brain. So you get inflammation of your brain and your meninges. Why? Because it's going through the, it barges through the cribriform plate it gets into your brain, it inflates, it causes an immune response in your, in your brain and in your meninges. So how does this present? Anytime you have meningitis, you're going to get fever. Again, this is non-specific. You're going to get fever. You're going to have malaise. You're going to get headache. But this is the key. You're going to get stiff neck. AKA nuchal rigidity. So when they say fever, headache, and then they say stiff neck, you have meningitis. Every time. Now meningitis can be caused by different things. Exactly. This is one of the causes of meningitis. Understand? So how do you tell the difference between this meningitis and meningitis like is caused by bacteria, which you guys will learn, or viral meningitis? So basically what happens is this is rapidly, it has a rapid onset. <coughs> what do I mean by this? Is within a day to one week, you're gonna have a guy going from getting headaches to getting a stiff neck, and then suddenly it's gonna be comatose, okay? So what's gonna happen? Usually when, you ha when a doctor suspects that you have meningitis, they're actually gonna do a spinal tap. And this is diagnostic. So how do you diagnose this? You're actually going to see amoebas in your spinal fluid. So you're not going to have bacteria. So they're going to tell you there's no bacteria. It's negative for gram stain. That just means, it's not negative gram stain, it just means that you have no bacteria. Bacteria. Okay, so amoebas in your spinal fluid is diagnostic. Now guys, this, you don't notice it says that you give aflatoxin B's once for a few survivors. The reason is the, the patients come in with meningitis-like symptoms, and the doctor thinks, oh, this is just meningitis. They do the spinal tap, and the CSF looks like bacterial meningitis. It's cloudy, there's low glucose, there's neutrophils. Fantastic, let's give this guy some antibiotics. But the problem is they give them antibiotics, and then a few days later, they're dead. Before they can even change the treatment, the patient dies. So it's important yeah. as future physicians Always look under the microscope, just in case it's neglected. Yeah. So yeah, the way treated is amphotericin B. So actually, the way I like to, so there's two ways, there's two uh, mnemonics I like to think about. There's the actual, the mnemonic in first aid, which is neglaria kind of sounds like an algae bottle. So that's supposed to help you memorize um, that it's transmitted through fresh water. And also, you guys know when you drink water or something really cold? Yeah, that's exactly the expression I had. I don't know what an algae bottle is. It's actually the plastic bottle that you put like that. <laughs> exactly, don't worry, I got another mnemonic. It's not too covered, it's that. That's it, raise it up. Yeah, it's that. Look behind. Don't worry. Bro, oh, we got you covered. Yeah, we got you covered. Don't know where an algae bottle is, like Nazi and nine. We got another one in a second. Okay. Finish this one, finish this one. So now, Gene, so when you drink water really fast and it's really cold, remember you guys get a brain freeze? Yeah. So think about it, when you get it, it's rapid, right? So think about drinking really cold water, rapid onset of meningoencephalitis. You get a brain freeze, okay? Also, this is kind of a stretch. 
Nigeria kind of sounds like Nigeria. Algeria. Nigeria. No, for us, Jerry, like, Ben and Jerry's ice cream. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Guys, for those who don't know what a Nalgene bottle is, this works. Yes. For us foreign people who didn't learn English the real way, you don't know how to read English. I read as I say, I say Nigeria. That's what I say when I read. Yeah, Nigeria. This sounds. This is a G, a G or J. It's the same thing. Same hey, way. you guys, when you have your ice cream. Okay, and you're eating your ice cream really fast, and you know you have the corrosive ice cream nowadays. You know you're really eating that stuff fast. You get a brain freeze, and rapidly, right? So rapid onset of meningoencephalitis. Guys, remember this. Habits. Diagnostic is amoebas. Okay, that's it. John, now you get the floor. You get to chill. You get to talk. Just give me a little water. A little water. Mm. Mm. <laughs> Batman. John Man. All right, guys. So if anybody doesn't know what that symbol is, that's the bat symbol, okay? This whole parasite is going to revolve around Batman. Specifically, Bruce Wayne. Thank you, Pedro. You were the inspiration for this one. Because you told us to get a mnemonic for Bruce E.I. So we got Bruce E.I. Wayne E.I. All right. Okay, all right, all right, all right. Uh, let's get serious here. Come on. All right, so. I'm going to use black, because Batman only wears black. I asked him, he doesn't like any other color. All right, so trypanosoma. Brucei. Guys, get that Bruce Wayne, Brucei. Oh, 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 guys, sorry, sorry, sorry. So Bruce Wayne is the man behind the mask. In case anybody didn't know. I know Lois, oh, what is that one? <laughs> Doesn't know. Lois Lane. That's, That's Superman. Superman. <laughs> you know, Batman always has to be. She always says, he always has a different chick, I forget. Anyway, we'll get to his women in a minute. Anyway, <laughs> we're going to show him a Bruce Um There's two types, two other names, okay? Got it. There's Gam, Beyonce. Guys, half the time when we're like practicing this, we're not trying to learn the content, we're trying to learn how to spell. So it's the craziest thing. And then row Des, C N C. <laughs> All right? They have weight density and say that one's yet to reach first aid. All right, so think about Gabensiense and Rodensiense. Gabensiense is in the west, and Rodensiense is in the east. Now, you, you may be asking, John, how the hell are we going to remember that? And I'll just say, I don't know. No, I got one. All right, Gabensiense. Gabensiense. Kind of sounds like gamble, okay? Gabensiense, gamble. Gamble and CNC, okay? You gamble in Vegas. Vegas is in the West. Nahum? Or no Nahum? Yeah. Vegas is in the West, we gamble in the West. Rodentia or Rodentia is the other one? It's Rhode Island. Oh, yeah. Rhode Island, look at the same thing throughout the class. Rhode Island is in the NCNC. Rhode Island. Let's give him a right. This is really good, guys. Round of applause. We've got this. Rhode Island, Viva Las Vegas, okay? All right, stands for Rhode Island. Don't, no, don't worry about how to spell it. They won't test you on it on the board. All right. All right, all right. So I know, I know what you wonder. I know what you're thinking. Where, where do you get, where do you get Trypanosoma brucei from? Well, you get it from the, no, you don't get it from this marker. You get it from the C, C, fly. Now, you might be wondering, how are we going to remember T.T. Fly? Well, let me tell you, Bruce Wayne is a stud, all right? He's a billionaire. He's good looking. I'm just like him, except without the billionaire part, okay? He always walks in. When he walks into a party or he walks into a club, he's always got two models by his side. You know, he walks in the dark night. You know, he always walks in with two models on his side. So now he has a boatload of models. Anyway, his models, without fail, always have Big TT. Okay? <laughs> they always have big TT. Now, mosquito bites, TT. Okay? So that's how you remember TT fly. TT means rest in Hebrew. So, TT, TT fly gives you children of Russia. I thought we get a lot more laughs in that. Guys, TT means like boobs, okay? So, like, <laughs> yeah, so, it's actually Hebrew for boobs. Yeah, that's what it is. When we're we talking, didn't, we didn't like make that up, man. <laughs> <laughs> you, know the you guys know the fungi guy? Like the guy who teaches you guys fungus? He actually couldn't believe that it's actually called CT. He's like, CT for real? Like, yeah, so, so. Anyway, CT fly, okay? So TT fly, Trypanosoma brucei. Just like sand fly in Lashmania, TT fly is the only thing, only thing that's going to give you Trypanosoma brucei, okay? So you hear TT fly, you think brucei. 
Yeah, it kind of runs. Okay. Chimney Silver Bruce CI, TT Fly. Okay. So what happens? TT Fly bites you. Okay? Step one. Step one. Um, you get a painful ulcer. Okay? So at the spot where the CT fly bites, you get this big reddish mark that's really painful. That's the first sign. That's the first sign maybe a patient will present with. They'll say, hey, doc, I got bit. This is hurting me. Okay? What'd you get bit by? Oh, some fly. You got big boots. All right. <laughs> so the painful ulcer, at, it goes away. In two, after about two weeks, painful ulcer goes away. Okay? Then you get step two. This is for both. This is for both. East side, what side? Alright. Both. Number two. Then you get, remember, anytime a microbe uh, introduces itself into the blood, into the immune system, you get an immune response. Okay? So you get a fever. You get lymph node swelling. Okay? And you get like a dizziness. That's another symptom they might say. Okay? But now, this fever is a little weird, because the fever will last about one week, okay, and then it goes away. But a few weeks later, what do I? Write? Few weeks later, it returns. So it's kind of like a cyclical fever. What other disease do you remember has cyclical fevers? Why? Does it have cyclical fevers? Right, because it reintroduces itself out of the red blood cells. By the way, just clarification on that, it is the red blood cell phase, even when it bursts out, that whole thing is erythrocytic stage, and when it's in the liver, it's exoerythrocytic stage. So that's confirmed. I got a question on it on my board yesterday. So, so you know. But this has the same principle. It reintroduces itself to the immune system, but different mechanism, okay? So trypanosoma brucei, you know, like anything else, has an antigen, you know. The antigen gets exposed to the immune system, and the immune system makes antibodies to fit that specific antigen. Now trypanosoma brucei is smarter than that. You know Bruce Wayne's got his utility belt. You know, he uses one weapon, he can change it up if he has to. You know, so trypanosoma brucei has a lot of different antigens it can use, okay. So the moment the body does the fever and all this and makes the antibodies, that's when trypanosoma brucei changes its antigen. So it changes its antigen like this, and now these antibodies that were made specifically for the original antigen don't work anymore. So you gotta take all those antibodies, throw them in the trash, and make a whole new immune response and make whole new antibodies. So that's why you get the cyclical fever. The fancy word for this is antigenic variation. Okay? They can ask you a question on this. By that we mean us, can I ask you a question on this, you know, so you better prepare. Okay, are we okay with step one and two? Okay, good. Step three. This is where the disease gets its name. So, trypanosoma brucei causes African sleeping sickness. Okay? So we already talked about African, because this happens in West and East Africa. Sorry if I didn't mention that. West and East Africa, so that's the African. Now I'm going to get to the sleeping sickness. So step three is CNS penetration. CNS penetration. So what happens? So first I'm going to do the mnemonic. That's what the comments said they want me to do. And then we're going to write it on the board, okay? So I think of African sleeping sickness as if someone woke me up at 3 o'clock in the morning. Think about when you get, someone wakes you up at 3 o'clock in the morning, what it's like. First of all, you like sleep, okay? You can't even walk straight, you're so tired. You know, you're kind of walking like this. You're slurring your speech, someone tries to talk to you, you slur speech, you know? And then if someone hits you, you get like angry. If your roommate gets in your way, you get like upset. You have like a personality change. You're not yourself when you get woken up in the middle of the night, okay? So think about that. Those are the symptoms, all right? The person is sleepy. They have slurred speech. Um, they have ataxia, so that means they're not, that they uh, can't walk correctly, they have like, uns not unstable, gait. unstable gait. And they also have personality changes. So if you think of African sleeping sickness as getting woken up at 3 o'clock in the morning, you can understand what happens. 
This is the bad part though. If you get woken up at 3 o'clock in the morning, you won't go into a coma and die. <laughs> These people will, okay? So after this stage, you get coma and death. Now you can remember this, African sleeping sickness. How, you can remember Chukun Soma calls it, Bruce C.I. calls it sleeping sickness because think about it, Bruce Wayne, aka Batman, is up all night fighting crime. All night fighting crime. Because he can only navigate at night. He's wearing a black suit. Can't do that during the day. So he does all his crime fighting at night. So when he goes to work in the morning, he's really <laughs> sleepy. Okay? Because he's up all night. So that's how you remember it. Alright? Any questions on this? Yeah. So Bruce C.I., Jim, Denise, and Rhode, Rhode Island Bees all cause the same things. So, so this is how it works. So it's actually Trypanosoma Bruce C.I. Gemensiae and Trypanosoma Bruce C.I. Rodensiae. Uh, so these two are different subtypes of this. Okay? Um, and they all call the same thing, but at different speeds. We'll talk about that in a minute. Yep, Is only the fever coming back up there a week in cyclical, or the whole, like, three... The whole, the whole situation comes back. Um, yeah? So you get your painful ulcer, it goes away in two weeks, and then you get a, then you get a fever, yeah. and the swelling of the lymph nodes and the dizziness, and then one week later, you no, get... No, so the one week it goes away, then a few weeks after that, you get a new cycle of fever and stuff. When do you get those CNS uh, problems? Depends what you got. We'll talk about that in a minute. So okay. let me just finish up then. So this is the thing. Rodensiae, you go from bite to CNS symptoms very quickly. Sometimes in a matter of one to two weeks, like really fast. Like this is a bad one. So this we call rapid onset. Now how are we going to remember rapid onset? Because Rodensiense starts with an R, and R, and rapid starts with an R. So they both start with an R, remember Rodensiense, rapid onset, okay? Gambensiense <coughs> is slower, and you go from bite to CNS, sometimes from months to years. And through those months to years, you have that cycle of fever, lymph nodes, swelling, dizziness for a week, and then three weeks, four weeks go by, and then again, cycle. So Gambensia is the slow onset, Rodensia is the rapid onset, okay? So now one more thing, and then we can take questions. The drugs we use, okay? You have it written there, so I'm just gonna write it here so for the sake of completeness, you have it written there. Suramine is used for the bloodborne disease. Why? Because I think the blood, the blood is the serum, right? Suramine, seramine, that's how you remember that one. Okay, that's how you remember you use suramine for the bloodborne diseases, okay? And then you have melarsoprol. Uh -huh. Melarsoprol for um, the, the CNS symptoms. Now, I, I got a good one for this. The first day's got a good one for this, but I'm taking it. All right, so look at the first words of melarsoprol. Mela, okay? Think melatonin. Okay, melatonin. What is melatonin? It is the chemical that helps you put you to sleep. Okay? And it's in the brain. So you can remember that melarsoprol is used for, for the brain's symptoms, alright? Dylan, don't make me send you to the principal's office. <laughs> uh, and then, wait, hold on. One last thing. One last thing. Alright, guys. I have suramine, I have melarsoprol. If I tell you a patient comes in with an early version of the Gambensiense uh, infection, which drug do you think you'd give them? And then the Rodensiense? Both. No, no, just melarsoprol, okay? That's what I'm saying. So, like, you can associate it like that. They, since it goes so fast, it might be in the CNS by the time you catch it, so give them melarsoprol, okay? But the, the question will make it very specific on where the, the bug is. Do you guys understand? Yeah. I didn't get that. Okay, so, because, you give both? I don't think so. So, so if the infection is still in the blood, you give suramine, okay? You don't want to just give melarsoprol and suramine if they don't have CNS problems, because then you get all kinds of side effects for no reason, okay? Uh, question, yeah? So once it goes to the CNS, it's done, it's no longer in the blood. Yeah, then you just get the sleepiness and the ataxia and the personality changes. What are like some scenarios that they give so you can distinguish whether it's in the blood or in the So we haven't seen a question yet where they test you between these two. Usually you just have to know it's like African sleeping sickness, but just in case, we got you covered. Okay, but most of them, this is the case, this is how they tell it. Patient comes in upset because he's just sleepy all day. You know, he's falling asleep on the job and his boss is about to fire him. You find out through investigation that he just came back from Kenya. You know, 
And, and then he admits that, yeah, I've been kind of having fevers every couple of weeks, so I don't know why. You know? And then, okay, what does he have? What vector did he get the disease? What drugs do you use? You know? So, okay. Um, what drugs would you use in this scenario? What drugs? Thank you. Aiden. Really quickly, the antigenic variation, is it like so uh, uh, Anand's question was: Does the antigenic variation keep happening, even um, every time? Yes, it happens every time. That's how it's able to survive. The only reason Trypanosoma survives is because it keeps changing its antigen. Okay. All right, guys. Next one. One last question, then if you have other questions, write them down on your paper and come down to me. I'll answer everything after. Did you mention the, the diagnosis or is it just Oh, 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 my bad, guys. You know, the diagnosis is like, they don't really use any questions, but for diagnosis, on blood smear, you'll see the, you'll see the protozoa. So they'll say, uh, like, they'll, they'll describe in the question stem, on blood smear, motile protozoa, or motile organisms. Remember, motile organisms, protozoa. Erasing this. Any questions, any, any and all questions come, come to us after, we'll be happy to answer. Okay guys, so we're going to switch to GI for the job. I'm going to give you a quick intro while John erases. So basically what happens is these are the protozoa that affects your GI tract. So you're actually going to see what it's going to cause. It's going to cause diarrhea. But it's going to cause three different types of diarrhea. We're going to have three different bugs with three different types of diarrhea. You're going to have fatty diarrhea. You're going to have bloody diarrhea. And you're going to have watery diarrhea. John is going to talk about fatty diarrhea. I'm going to talk about bloody, and then he's going to finish up with water, and then we're going to have a mnemonic. Guys, it's really, really important to know, to associate which diarrheas with which bugs. It's so important, we put it on the paper for you, so you don't forget. And we put it in bold letters, okay? So you really won't forget. Giardia, lambda time. All right, Giardia, lambda. Okay, where do you get it? So for all these GI protozoa, they're all going to be the same. Okay? They're all going to be in cyst form when you ingest them, and they're all going to be in fresh water. Oh, nice. In this case, usually you get it. Usually people get it. Usually who gets it? You get campers get it. Why? Because they're out camping, and they're like, oh, look, a freshwater stream. This water looks amazing. Amazing. So they drink it. <laughs> then they have the poops. All right? So freshwater streams where you get it. Okay. So you ingest the cyst goes into the GI tract, all right? And then the cysts hatch, and they cover the intestine. So maybe if I draw this, you'll see. So I want you to draw this along with me, because this is one of the pictures they expect you to recognize, OK, Giardia. So you can kind of draw like, it's almost just like a heart, or kind of like a kite, OK? Kind of draw that shape first. Then you draw two circles. And then some whiskers coming off it, OK? Some whiskers. So now these whiskers are like flagella, so it can move around. But this circle is the important part, OK? These circles are like suction cups. So they can stick to the intestinal wall. Now it's important to understand, they don't penetrate the intestinal wall. They stick to it, OK? So think about it. If you have a lot of these parasites just covering the intestinal wall, then you can't absorb anything. So you get fat malabsorption. So if the fat is not going into the intestine, then it's coming out the other side. That's why they have fatty diarrhea, because they can't absorb fat. So you get fatty diarrhea. Now fatty diarrhea, I like to, like to explain it, is like foul-smelling stools. Okay, foul-smelling stools, that's how they describe it. Okay, so it's important, you'll see. Patient comes in, making, has gas, abdominal pain, fatty-smelling stools, uh, foul-smelling stools. They'll say fatty stools most of the time. Uh, you see the teenager just got back from a hiking trip. Says they uh, drink the fresh water. What is it? Giardia lambda. Okay? Question. I, I saw one, I remember I got one board question where for, for, foul, for fatty stool, they said it didn't flush well because fat floats. Yeah, and they yeah. literally said they didn't, they, they didn't say it was foul smelling. They just said diarrhea that didn't flush. Right. So, so if, like, if, you ever, if you ever like... Had a seen poop that floats. We've all seen poop that floats, guys. All right, don't be embarrassed. Uh, that is a lot. Of, it has a lot of fat content. Okay, fat is less dense than water. Um, so then um, they could, I guess, describe it like that too. Yes. Alexa, over there. Really what? 
Huh? Let's say with their GI and then covers the left. Cover the intestines, fatty. Okay, diagnosis. You see the cysts in the stool. Okay? They see the cysts in the stool. Everybody's happy. Okay? And that's how you diagnose it. Treatment time. This is a very simple one, okay? I'm going to draw the treatment in green so you can see the difference. Treatment is with metronidazole. We remember this, right, guys? Get. Yeah. All right, so get out of the way of the metro. Why? Because it's going to hit you. All right, T is for trichomonas vaginalis. Right? Remember those good memories? Yes. And to me, good for some, not so much for others. Mm -hmm. It's also there. G is for Giardia. And this is my best segue of the course. <laughs> e is for Entamoeba. What's Entamoeba, you ask? Well, Nazi's going to explain it to you right now. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you. You yeah, have one question. I was going to say, uh, lamb shawarma is fatty. Lamb shawarma is fatty, and Giardelli chocolate is fatty. So we got both. Fine. So if we... Can, can, can you read it? What do you need to read it? What do you need? Can you Yeah, we got... Uh, yeah, Matt, yeah, Matt. No, 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 your question? What do you need? <laughs> Dude, you have a question. You feel comfortable. We're G G I A R D I A. <laughs> you know how many times I practice that? <laughs> All right, guys. Next one. We're almost done here. We have three more. Okay. So you guys asked that we do the mnemonics beforehand. So, guys, I want you to remember. Entamoeba, yes. first of all, let me give a shout out to my fiance Ashley for actually giving me this mnemonic. Woo! Oh! Make me look good. Alright, so Entamoeba, E-N-T, is for inter. H-I-S is his. And Lytica kind of sounds like liver. Lytica, liver. Doesn't sound like liver, it does now. <laughs> this bug actually goes through your GI tract and ends up in your liver. I'll get to that in a moment. Okay? So just think of this mnemonic, take it in, and then we'll start talking about it. So again, you're going to have cysts in fresh water. Okay? You're going to ingest it. It's going to end up in your GI tract. In your small intestine. Next, what is going to happen? It's going to hatch. It's it's a favorable environment. It's going to create a trophozoid. Now the trophozoid is the actual infected form. Okay. So what's going to happen is, is here's your small intestine. So John was describing Giardia. Giardia is like a kite. It actually sucks onto your small intestine, but doesn't penetrate through. Okay, so it causes malabsorption. You can't absorb things through your small intestine. This one is different. The trophozoite actually barges into the intestinal wall. So think about it. Anytime you, you penetrate skin, you penetrate an organ, you're going to get bleeding. Okay? So this actually causes... Okay. This is actually going to cause bloody... So you're going to barge into the intestinal wall. It's going to cause bloody diarrhea. Does everyone understand that? Yeah. Okay. Uh, the, first one, the first one you guys went over, didn't it barge through the wall? No, it's stuck onto the wall. It didn't no, go through. Oh, yeah, yeah. It also yeah, but it doesn't through. cause diarrhea. It doesn't cause diarrhea. It's a little, it's a little yeah. slicker. You know, it's like yeah, it like goes through. It just like it kind of maneuvers its way. This one actually penetrates and okay, so it destroys it's through, like destroys as it goes. <laughs> okay? So this causes, the first symptom is bloody diarrhea. Okay? So now you have your... your uh, a trophozoite hanging out in your small intestine, and it's going to go into the blood vessels of your GI tract. All right, I know I don't have candy, but pop quiz. All right, where what drains the GI tract? Like, what's the next stop? I go into the veins of the GI tract. What's my next stop? Portal vein and liver. Okay. Good. So, so why? Because you want to filter. Anytime you eat something, you want to filter out the toxins. So you want to go through the liver because the liver actually filters out the toxins. Okay, so you don't want to have anything toxic into your body. So you're going to have, you're going to go, so this bug actually travels through the portal vein. 
and it actually enters, here we go, enters his liver. Okay. Or her liver, if she drinks. Okay, so this is where the pneumonia, come, pneumonia comes through. Okay, guys, quickly, I forgot to mention, when it barges through, sorry, when it bar barges through the intestinal wall, it causes an ulcer. So you might say on histology, we saw an ulcer. What's an ulcer? Just means a hole. So that's why you get bleeding. So it barges through and it causes a hole and you get bleeding and it's called an ulcer. So anytime you have a hole, it's called an ulcer. In, in the first day, they refer to it as the flask ulcer, the flask shaped ulcer. Yeah. Okay. So now you have in your liver, you have your uh, trophozoites. Again, like I talked to you guys about toxoplasma, you're going to create an abscess around these trophozoites. Why? Because you don't want it to spread to other tissues of your body. So you're going to create an abscess. So they might say you have a liver abscess. So all that means, again, is that you're going to have acute inflammation that walls off the, the, trophoz sorry, the trophozoite with the entamoeba in it. I mean, sorry, with the uh, macrophage or the neutrophils in it. Okay? This isn't going to present with right upper quadrant pain. Why? Because your liver is your right upper quadrant. So you're going to have an inflammation in your liver, and it's going to cause pain. So your liver abscess, right upper quadrant pain, and also they might say you have like an anchovy exudate. All that means is you're going to have pus. Because when the neutrophils come, and they're duking it out with the entamoeba, when they die out, they actually create pus. You'll learn about that more Where? in... What? So if, actually, if you do you like have a, if pus, you like go into the if, if you go into the abscess like you take a needle and stick into the abscess, pus will pus. come out. You guys are gonna learn more about that when you take immuno. Basically, what happens is the neutrophils come, they attack the protozoa, and when they die out, when they're done with their job, they actually when they die out, they create a pus. So they create pus. That's how you get pus. In the liver. In the liver. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, guys, 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 just to get it straight, alright guys? Entomy guys, 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 entomoeba enters the liver, okay? The, immune, the, immune, the macrophages in the immune system makes an abscess around the entomoeba organism, okay? So remember Nati said before that fighting goes on in the abscess, right? So you send in neutrophils to fight the entomoeba. When neutrophils die, they become pus. So if you're sending neutrophils to kill the antamoeba and the neutrophils are dying, naturally the abscess will be full of pus. Okay? Yeah, That's what we're saying. This is where you see blood similar to the toxic side of the Why is it like ulcer happening and blood happening? It's a little slicker. It's like going through yourself. It's not actually barging through your intestine. That's what it's not damaging. It's not damaging. It's like trying to be as slick as possible and then it tries to get to your blood. Okay? Yeah. So you get jaundice. Um, good. It caused enough damage. All right, guys, that's one more question. We got to be What? Yes. And where okay. did you find it? Remember, the trophozoite is actually the infected liver, guys. The liver. No, no, no. Right. I mean, Next. how do you get it? How do you diagnose this? Oh, <laughs> Okay. So there's two ways. So I forgot to mention one thing. I'm sorry. So there's. Two things that can happen here. You can either hatch and become a trophozoite, or the cysts actually stay as cysts. They don't hatch. They just like someone ingests cysts in the water, and then they, they start passing it through the stool. They ingest a bunch of cysts, and they stay in their GI tract. I'll get to that, why that's important in a minute. So there's two ways to diagnose it. You can either check cysts in the stool, and what's unique about these cysts is they're actually gonna have two to four nuclei, We'll show you guys a picture. Or you can see trophozoites. And within the trophozoites, you're actually going to see red blood cells. OK? So yeah, you see that. So here, so guys, this is the cyst. That's this a cyst. Nuclei. Sometimes there can be four nuclei. And then you see in there, you see that the nucleus is the part that's this part. Right and these are the red blood cells. OK? Right? Everyone see that? Does anybody not see that? OK, this is the nucleus. Right here, the lighter thing. Right here also. Uh, the nucleus of the entamoeba trophozoa. Okay? And this is the cyst of the entamoeba. Okay? Cyst of the entamoeba with two nuclei and trophozoa with one nuclei. That's how you tell. So they're going to have, the cyst is going to have two to four nuclei. Point and it's going to say huh? cyst Point in the again. school. Hold on. Cysts, two nuclei, 
or four, you'll see in first aid also, trophozoite, one nucleus, red blood cell. Guys, come up with a question <coughs> after, after. Yeah, okay. Next, how do you treat this? So guys, when I told you, there can be people who are asymptomatic and just have the cysts in their GI tract. Just like carriers. You just carry it. So that you treat this with idoquinol. Okay? This is for the cysts. But you actually have a full blown infection with the trophozoite, you should use metronidazole. Again, the mnemonic, guys, this is very, it's like a pretty good mnemonic, so please remember this. So GED is Giardia, G is Giardia, E is Entamoeba, and T is Trichomonas. Right. Uh, the question about the treatment is there a scenario where you can have both the trepozoid and the cystic stage? I think, I think when they treat it. No, so what is metronidazole is more of a broad spectrum. Yeah. Iodoclinol specific for the cysts. So if you get some metronidazole, it'll kill the cysts and the trepozoid. You don't want it to be like, you don't want them to like. It has some more side effects. So yes. Yes. Right. And you don't. Mom. Okay, so guys, um, this is sorry, this is how it presents. This is how the question will present, okay? Patient comes, they have diarrhea, sometimes it'll say bloody diarrhea, but sometimes it says with flecks of blood. If there's any blood there, it's intimiba, any blood. Because the only time you can have blood is when it penetrates, and this is the only one that penetrates, okay? Um, and then they'll say, either they'll say, um, you know, diagnosis, fine, cysts, how do you treat it, metronidazole. Or it might say, a patient comes in um, with bloody diarrhea, you find out that it's endemiba, what's the next step in management? The next step in management will be ultrasound the liver to see if there's abscesses. That gets fair game also. So they can either go one way and say they came in with right upper quadrant pain and bloody diarrhea, or the opposite. And, and you have to know. Okay? Uh, I want you to do the, oh, okay. Next up, cryptosporidium. Okay? The same thing, you, you ingest. Here in this case, you ingest oocytes. Okay, and in the oocytes, you have sporozoites. I don't think you really have to know this because the, the, the mechanism for this isn't so clear, so I'm going to keep it as simple as possible. So the things you'll see in the picture are o oocytes with sporozoites inside. Okay, you ingest them from water, okay? And sometimes you can have cryptosporidium outbreaks in like tap water, okay? No. So you can get it from water, and then it, it ends up causing mechanism unclear, so that means you're not responsible for it. It causes watery diarrhea, okay? But not just in anybody. Immunocompetent people, most of the time are asymptomatic. This is the association you must make. HIV patients or anybody else who's immunocompromised. Okay? Immunocompromised. Um, but this is important. An HIV patient with diarrhea, you have to think of cryptosporidium. An HIV patient with diarrhea, you have to think of cryptosporidium. I know I just repeated myself, but it's that important. They, they, I've seen so many questions where they just say, HIV patient comes in well, uh, with diarrhea. Not even watery diarrhea. They tell you diarrhea. You gotta think cryptosporidium, okay? You have, to, you have to put it on your differential right away. How do you tell the difference? How do you diagnose it? You have to do it on an acid fast stain. You must know this. You must know this. They can ask you what stain do you use to diagnose this, or they can or they can put this in the question. If they put this in the question, acid fast, diarrhea, and HIV, that's cryptosporidium every time. Like you hit the middle switch on the top row. That's what it looks like, okay? This is what acid fast stain is, all right? You see this bright pink? Okay? That's acid fast. You have to know that. You'll get questions. They'll describe an HIV patient with diarrhea. What are you staying with? Acid fast, okay? Guys, this, this is a really high yield picture. Yes. So remember this. Like, like NBME high yield picture, okay? <laughs> Open light a second. Um, no, we had, I think we had a description on our last year's NBME. Okay, another bug is called Isospora belli. Okay, it's the same thing, it does the same thing as cryptosporidium. Okay, number one, it's an HIV patient. Number two, it causes diarrhea. And number three, it stains acid fast. Why am I telling you this? It's so low yield, it's not even in first aid. Number one, sometimes they can put it in answer choices. So, like, 
If you try to decide what the answer is, you have to know that I sat for Bella is this, so you can knock it out. Or they can give you a case saying, patient comes in, HIV patient, has watery diarrhea, stained with acid fast stain, and you're like, man, I got this. I just got to pick the right answer. Then you look, 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 look. I don't see cryptosporidium. You look, look, look again. Still don't see cryptosporidium. I saw Spabella, and sometimes an alternative to put them there. For HIV patient, diarrhea, acid fast. I don't know if you have to know this, but this is one thing one of the sources told us. One difference between the cryptosporidium and I saw Spabella, I really doubt they'll say this to you and they'll ask you, but we won't ask it, but just in case. Cryptosporidium, as you can see, are circles. Circles. I saw Spabella, are ovals. <laughs> That's it. There's no real treatment. I'm not going to write anything on the board because there's no real treatment. But the, the one thing you can do, the only, the only thing you can do for cryptosporidium is to prevent. So you clean out water supplies. And you can also give this nitazoxanide for immunocompetent patients. Because if they're carrying it, you want to kill it off so they don't, um, so they don't like, continue to spread it. Sometimes you can try to treat an immunocompromised patient with this nitazoxanide so it could show up in a question. Think Crypt is pretty if you see this drug in question. But it's really hard to treat. Once an HIV patient gets this, they're pretty much done. Okay, I'm gonna quickly do a quick summary. Yes. Isn't that drug also for TB? No, no, that's the first one. Okay, guys, okay, quickly, quick we're summary, we're almost there. We have this and one more club and we're done. Guys, this is how I want you to remember all the diarrheas, okay? The different ones. Again, on the board, you only have a minute and like 20 seconds to answer a question. You have to be fast. Okay, so GI reminds you this is the GI protozoa. Okay, it also reminds you Giardia. Thanks. Entamoeba. Good job, guys. Okay, so why do I put it in this order? First of all, we're in Israel. This is why we spell geek like this. Okay, and also. I want you guys to think it's in the decreasing viscosity. So this is fatty, this is bloody, and this is watery. So if you're on a test and you're not sure and you know it's a protozoa and you can't remember, write geek on, the, on your sheet, you know it decreases in viscosity and you got it. This is quick guys, you want to be quick on these questions. This is how you're fast, okay? Alright guys, so I've got some bad news for you. And I really mean this is bad news. Um, you know, for the CBLs and for the IRADs and for the quiz, we're really kind of focusing on protozoa because we taught it. But because of time constraints, we weren't able to teach worms. So all the worms in first eight are fair game on the MDME. Like the breakdown is going to be, you have 10 questions for parasites, five on protozoa, five on worms. Okay? So hopefully, us giving you the foundation of protozoa will help make it easier to learn the worms. Okay? But you're still responsible for them. We're going to teach you one worm today because this is going to show up on your IRAT tomorrow and I don't want you guys to get blindsided. And then there's going to be other worms on the, on the, on the CBL where you'll have you know, resources for that. Okay? So we're just going to give you quick facts, be able to associate all this stuff by tomorrow. Okay? Trichosoma. Transmission. You get it from freshwater snails. Okay? And thanks to Ryan giving me a little um, more descriptive of how it happens, the trichosoma will infect the snail, hijack the um, reproductive system, reproducing the snail, and then basically, like, kill the snail. Explode everywhere, okay? And then spread all around the water. I know, but I already made the poop joke, you know, I can't. <laughs> <laughs> all right, snails. So, freshwater snails, and then they'll explode. Kaboom. Okay? And then let off Sir Surye. Sir Carrier. I can't read English or spell English, all right. Sir Terry A. All right, think like Cersei Lannister, you know, like in Game of Thrones, like Cersei, Sir Cersei A. So it's not good, okay? So these things are like the larva form, like the baby, the baby worms, okay? And what they do is, they're swimming in the water, and they, if they find a human host with broken skin, they swim into the broken skin, okay? Once in the body, they mature into the worm form. Okay? Now this is the thing about the worm form. Unlike the, the bugs we were talking about, not like the protozoa we were talking about before, the worm 
does not induce immune response at all. None whatsoever. But for no immune response. Anything. Okay? This worm. This this worm the worm form of schistosoma does not induce immune response. Okay? We'll talk about what it does in one second, okay? But this is what it does. So the worm form will plant itself in two places, okay? And there's and we're actually gonna name the two forms of schistosoma that are in first state, okay? You have schistosoma, I'm just writing S, Mansoni, and schistosoma hematobium, H-A-E, this one I got, hematobium, okay? The Mansoni and the hematobium, these are two separate species. So you either get infected with this or you get infected with this, okay? Mansoni plants itself in the liver and the spleen. It's where it plants itself, basically makes a home there, finds a plot of land, builds a house, has some kids. And hematobium, very important because this one's more common, on the boards, plants itself in the bladder. So what does it do? How, if, it doesn't, if the worm doesn't cause an immune response, why are we even talking about it? We wouldn't even know it's there. The worm lays eggs. The eggs are what cause the immune response. Okay? So your body is attacking the egg, it's not even attacking the source. That's why this, this disease is chronic. Okay? So think, if we're having an immune response, so we're having lymphocytes, inflammation, okay? In the liver and the spleen, what do you think is going to happen? We're going to get enlargement of the liver and the spleen. And what do we like to call that here at Sketchy and Nati and John? Hepatosplenomegaly. So that's what you get. But if you have inflammation in these organs for too long, you get fibrosis. And if you fibrose the liver, you die. Because it's the liver. You need, live in order to, you need liver in order to live. Whatever. Okay? So that's what happens in S. Mansoni. It makes eggs. The immune system keeps attacking the eggs. And then you get this um, manifestation. This one is really important because you're going to actually see this in renal next year. When we saw it in renal this year, we were like, the hell is this? Next year, you're going to be like, yeah. <laughs> All right? So it plants itself in the bladder, lays eggs. Same thing. It causes inflammation. But in this tissue, so what happens? You get inflammation of the transitional epithelium. Remember, transitional epithelium is in the bladder. So the transitional epithelium keeps, it keeps having to regenerate itself over and over again. It keeps having to regenerate it. So what do we know about cells? The more they regenerate, the more chance you have a mutation, right? So the inflammation can lead to squamous cell carcinoma of the bladder, okay? So next year you're going to learn about squamous cell carcinoma of the bladder. You're going to learn schistosoma, schistosoma hematobium of the cough, and you're going to say, I miss you, John. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so sorry for that. <laughs> One symptom you can get, because it's in the bladder and it's causing this inflammation and um, epithelium turnover, you can get blood. Blood in the urine. A uh, no, fancy word for blood in the urine is hemat hematiuria. Hematiuria. Okay? So now, who does this present in? Usually an Egyptian man will come in, they like to use the word Egyptian, and he was a water farmer. So that means he spends his whole days Kind of like moisture in the lake over there. Huh? He's a moisture farmer on Tatooine. I don't know what. Don't worry about it. <laughs> anyway, so um, basically, basically these water farmers, they spend all day with like in water up to their waist Not and they're just like doing their farming thing. So they get these chronic schistosoma infections and they're likely to come in with squamous cell carcinoma of the bladder. Now, just for hematobium, okay? But hematobium is the one that comes up. That's why we put it in the keyword. Um, Last thing, and then we're done. The treatment, and this is important, and it's important because you have to be able to associate it for tomorrow's uh, CDL and IRA, okay? Don't, don't let this one slide. Prazi won't tell. All right? That is the drug for schistosoma. All right? That is the drug for schistosoma. One last thing, you'll notice when studying the worms, okay? Look at the trends, all right? So, like, you have the trematodes and, like, the nematodes. 
So nematode, basically, you use the same drug for all of them. And the trematode, you can basically use the same drug for all of them. Sometimes you'll get on the board, you'll see someone with an infection, you'll know it's a worm infection, but you won't know which one. But luckily, in the question, they'll ask you, oh, which drug do you use? Okay? So use that when studying. We have one question up there? Uh, there could be a couple of a quiz, but the ratio the ratio is going to be a lot more protozoa to, to nematodes on the quiz, but on the MDME it's 50-50. Okay? okay? So if you're looking to pass, just use us. If you're looking to kick ass, learn first day. Guys, a cool, couple things. You got, some of you guys emailed us about what, how to study for this IRAT. You guys saw that it's very straightforward. Study our sheet, study first aid. You guys can get 100%. We're really happy that you guys all got, like, I think the class was like a nine year above. Um, for the MBME, you guys don't have a lot of information to study right now. I'm, I mean, it's all relative, right? So it's going to start picking up when you get into bacteria and you get into viruses. So use the time just to learn some of the worms. It's like, and give yourself the time now instead of like cramming before the MBME because it's a lot. Okay, guys? Guys, this is our final performance of the year, so. Questions come up. We, we wanted to thank you. Uh, yeah. so, I was really inspired by your Google Forms. And I sent out, uh, you know, like a little survey. Uh -huh. <laughs> so this is for you. Uh -huh. And yeah. this is for you. And this is from our whole class. Oh, thanks, guys. You guys are the best. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.